Oh, today I have a few brief announcements about some changes of schedules that's going to concern tomorrow. It's already written down on the whiteboard outside the doors, but just in case someone didn't notice, we will be switching around the uh, workshop times and keynote time a little bit. So we will start as planned with 9 o'clock with coffee, and then we will continue at 9.30. <laughs> so, Linda Lappinger is coming from um, uh, Denmark, from Roskilde University, uh, where she is Assistant Professor in Cultural Encounters. And her speech uh, is titled, Struggling with Diversity, Tracing Encounters with Difference. So, we welcome Linda, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, the organizing committee, for inviting me. And thank you all for coming, for being here today. It's wonderful to address a group of people who work with such different topics, different disciplines, come from different places, who engage with practitioners, with communities. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, and my talk, uh, the basic premise for my talk is that it's important to think about diversity and to think about whether we engage with diversity or whether we think about differences. And I will build this argument up during my talk, but first I want to say a bit about myself. I'm originally educated as a psychologist, and for example, as a psychologist, I've worked uh, as a volunteer with refugees and asylum seekers in Denmark. I've also been the chair chairperson for a volunteer psycholo psychological counseling, and I've also taught intercultural psychology to American students in Copenhagen. 
And then I moved to do something else. And that will be reflected by my talk, in my talk. Because some of the issues I've researched has been urban diversity. So the way I've structured uh, my keynote is that it will of course be a linear talk because it has a beginning and an end. But then I will see diversity and differences from different vantage points. So these vantage points will be a place in Copenhagen called Integration Gardens that was figured in my research. Uh, then the notion of diversity tourist as an analytical figure. And these two are from my research on urban diversity, a neighborhood in Copenhagen that is changing very quickly, and I'll talk more about that. And then some of the other places that I'll visit to interrogate diversity are related to the research that I do on racialization and whiteness. One is a topic that I call differentiated whiteness, and the other one is East to West migration in Europe. And I investigate these topics largely using autoethnography. So if one has to pinpoint me or kind of place me somewhere within the interdisciplinary things that I do, then I'm definitely an ethno ethnographer. And also using autoethnography is a big part of my work, as you'll hear in the keynote. And then finally, I'll look at diversity or differences from the perspective of intersectional pedagogy. And this is work in progress, and this relates very much to my teaching. And I think that will also be something that many of you can relate to through the work that you do, intercultural trainings or teaching, those of you who, are, who have that kind of practice. So before I go to the keynote, I want to position myself. I want to position the key terms that I use but actually, before that, I want to position myself in a different way, in addition to the ways I have until now. In 2004, I migrated from Latvia to Denmark. And 2004 was a significant year in the history of Europe and European Union, because that was the year when the European Union expanded eastwards, including eight Eastern and Central European states, Latvia being among them, the Baltic countries being among, among them. So my personal migration is also very embedded in the politics of what constitutes Europe. And I want to speak about the border crossing. So um, my migration happened in these circumstances that a year before I had met a Danish guy, I had fallen in love and he had moved to live with me in Latvia. And then my dad helped me to move to Denmark. My partner was already in Denmark and we were driving. So I had a lot of luggage. I had blankets and books and just way too much stuff. And also back then flights were much more expensive. And even though this was a couple of months after the enlargement of the EU, the border crossing from Poland to Germany was still the old fashioned one. You still had to wait in line. There were border guards. Um, and we were waiting in line. It was very hot. It was July and I was in the back seat of the car. My dad and his wife were in the front and I was sitting on this back seat, kind of teenager like uh, eating uh, canned peas from a can bought in a Polish supermarket. And I opened the window and I just poured out the liquid, the brine from the peas. And my dad's wife got so angry at me. She's like, Linda, what are you doing? They will see our number plates. They will see we're from Latvia. They will think we're barbarians. You cannot behave like this in Europe. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say. I was, I was just so surprised. And then my dad said, Linda, we are post-Soviet subjects. We grew up in the Soviet era. We have all this inferiority about moving about in Europe. You just should forget about it. Don't think about it. Just do what you do. Just... Just, just be yourself. And I had actually forgotten this episode for many years, but then doing this autoethnographic work and memory work, that's one of the things you do. You write down things that happen to you. And in this case, what I'm investigating is migrant positionality and how uh, being a migrant can mean different things, also for how people move about in space. And what happened to me when I came to Denmark was that in fact, I had forgotten my father's advice, but I also found it very hard to follow because in 2004 uh, there was uh, this fear in Denmark of so-called Eastern workers that would come and take Danish jobs. Um, and these pictures are from Google today, but the discourse was very similar back then. The men would come uh, and primarily work in construction, um, also in agriculture. Uh, and then women would come and they would tend to work um, in cleaning, in hotels, in, um, in restaurants. 
but they would come in such large numbers they would overflow the Danish labor market that would cause the wages to go down this would be a bad thing for Denmark a bad thing for Danish economy and uh, this has been researched for example Kristin Loftstotter writes about how in Iceland uh, Lithuanian migrants are perceived as cheap disposable workforce but there's also another trope this was not me actually at 18 moving to Denmark I was an Eastern European woman and these are also photos from today in from Google if if someone Googles in Danish an Eastern European woman you get these very sexualized photos and then you also get some marriage photos in a marriage kind of situation so these women from Eastern Europe which are who are sexualized and seen as maybe even mail order brides but these are all dating uh, pages that are advertised as you know this is where Danish men can meet Eastern European and Baltic women um, they are still seen as marriable these women so it's it's very much you know within the context of uh, it's not just um, sexual it, it might actually lead to a relationship so in my autoethnographic work uh, I call this migrant positionality that I entered when I moved to Denmark uh, being a young sexualized feminized Eastern European love migrant of limited social value because love migration is also a particular way of migrating right this was because I had a Danish partner it wasn't because I was entering a university immediately that was actually why we moved because we both wanted to study but that was not a part of this trope because I'm moving there because I have this Danish partner and that comes with all sorts of ideas attached upon meeting me and hearing that I had a Danish partner people would then assume that he must be much older wealthier probably my family in Latvia are poor uh, maybe they almost sold me to this Danish guy uh, my life in Latvia would have been very miserable if I had stayed there and again this kind of thing is embodied into hierarchies of uh, for example Dr. Danowski in her research talks about hierarchies of Europeanness and this is also Google today if you write why is Eastern Europe and then you wait for Google to com complete the sentence for you so poor, so cheap, so depressing, so creepy, considered a shattered belt, uh, so a place of conflict between um, civilizations. Why is Scandinavia so rich? Yes, yeah, so cold. Yes, it's cold. So, devel so developed. Why is Scandinavian design so popular? Why is Scandinavia so happy? So I was also entering a landscape of different meanings attached to these places, right? I was uh, escaping this creepy <laughs> depressing place to to you know to be properly happy and become a proper person in Denmark so this is about me and I'll return to this person who is a migrant in Denmark and what happened to her during the years this was 2004 and also 2005 I would say and then other things happened in my life and I became interpreted through different frames but of course these also shaped what I was able to do in Denmark uh, but before that I want to go back to the key concepts so why is cultural diversity a struggle I think this example that I used in the beginning illustrated how often when we think about cultural diversity we think about different cultures but already these diagrams with different words illustrate how diversity is linked to so many other things right uh, thinking about this Linda who moved from Latvia to Denmark you probably you might have noticed or maybe not that when I told about her I didn't speak about cultural diversity or I didn't speak about Danish culture and Latvian culture I could have because there are differently there, there are definitely cultural traits that characterize Latvia versus Denmark but what is so important is for example the political situation the historical factors that play into this different tropes that as you saw are very gendered so gender played a huge role for example social class so these issues are very very complex and very co contested and uh, one of the things so so as you see there are different and it's hard to see at the back I'm sorry for that but there are different notions associated whether one employs the notion of diversity versus cultural diversity but even if we think broadly and we think about diversity relating to age gender social class sexuality uh, bodily abilities um, and different other parameters then it's then it's I mean it's, it's just it's just so complex but I want to say a bit more about diversity also with relation to this conference 
So I picked the topic for my talk and then I looked at the conference program and I think the conference program and how diversity is framed there also illustrates some dilemmas. For example, diversity is both phrased in terms of something that causes fear or something that could contribute to sustainability. Uh, diversity can be a challenge, but it can also be a boost, right? Um, it can be related to and is related to pedagogy, training, management. Diversity can be a commodity and that is problematized, which will be in my talk, but also the keynote tomorrow. Uh, diversity is related to creativity, new possibilities, innovation, and diversity can also be a struggle, I claim. <laughs> so, so it is so many, it is very, very complex. But I think it also matters a lot how we think about culture. And I distinguish between two main ways of thinking about culture. And one of them is culture as a category uh, and culture as a ki sometimes quite static and essentialized identity, uh, which is, for example, reflected in some of the models that are used, uh, for example, Barry and colleagues' acculturation model, uh, which essentially posits that culture is something we carry um, and then we can choose to shed our original culture when we enter a new society and adopt the cultural values and beliefs of that society or we can also keep both cultures but then cultures as you as you can hear they become these entities they are kind of fixed sets of traits and then people in to an to an extent carry those traits with them and in this way of thinking about culture it also often is related to visible differences for example, in Denmark, when people speak about culture, it's often assumed that only immigrants have a culture. Danish culture is kind of a norm that all these other cultures are compared to and evaluated against. But Denmark doesn't really have a culture. And then in other settings, Denmark does have a culture. For example, when Denmark wants to export its culture. But in an integration setting, it's only immigrants whose culture is being problematized often. So I think it also becomes very I important to think about whose culture passes as the norm and often the norm that is not problematized in this uh, culture as a category thinking. And then also diversity management and policies, for example, integration policies that often tend to address the culture of the other uh, and cultural compatibility. And the other way of thinking about culture, and this is a very, of course, very um, crude distinction, uh, but that sees culture as relational and culture as a process, something that dynamically evolves, but also something that is not a package that one would either choose to have or not have, adopt or not adopt. And here I'm very inspired by Mary Louise Pratt, who in the 90s wrote about arts of the contact zone. And she focuses on the contact zone as a place where disparate cultures meet, clash, grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and subordination, like colonialism, slavery, or their aftermath as they are lived out across the globe today. So for example, when we think about the Google search of Eastern Europe and Scandinavia, that should definitely be seen in relation to various histories that situated Eastern Europe and Scandinavia uh, and that caused one place to be relatively richer and one place to be relatively poorer. Um, so, so we have to think of all these differences in power and of all these historical factors when we think about how cultures meet. And this is a point I really take from Mary Louise Pratt. So this idea that subjects and collectives are constituted through their relations to one another, uh, they do not necessarily exist as such um, in a way that does not change. In fact, they define one another when they encounter one another. Um, and this approach, which focuses on relationali re relationality and power, is also something that is embedded in how I think of cultural encounters. So some of you might not have heard of that term before. That's also the name of the program that I work at at Roskilde University. But it's also a theoretical notion. So this idea of the encounter, which etymologically comes from an idea about confrontation, something coming and clashing against something else, in fact, it denotes a meeting, so coming in contact. And it can both be a face-to-face -face encounter, but it can also be through representation. Some of the papers in this conference talk about representation. That is also an encounter, encountering the other through how they're being represented in advertising or different cultural products. Uh, and in these encounters, difference is negotiated, construct constructed and legitimated within contingent moments 
Um, so it's very specific to that point in time and specific to the context, the particular historical and spatial context, which mediates what actually takes place. And in the encounters, there's a change can happen. And this particularly relates to these promises of diversity, right? Um, sometimes it's change that is actually sought to be designed. And some of my colleagues are doing research on organized cultural encounters, where this is this idea, for example, religious dialogue meetings as an example of organized cultural encounter, where the parts that are meeting are supposed to learn something from one another, or there is supposed to happen some transformation of prejudice, um, some new areas of common ground that can be established within these meetings. So uh, encounters can also be um, actually very, uh, very elaborately set up uh, to result in change. And that will particularly relate to one of the examples that I want to share with you. But before I share this example with you, I want to situate this research a little bit, because the example of integration gardens is embedded into the study that I did of a neighborhood in Copenhagen <laughs> called Norvest. And Norvest is uh, represented very differently uh, in different city maps. Norvest is known as a multicultural, but also disadvantaged neighborhood that is gentrifying. And the process of gentrification means that a neighborhood that has been quite poor, but also quite cheap to live in, is becoming more popular. Now, West in 2010 was the least popular place in Copenhagen to live in. And last year, it was the place where proportionally the, house, the price of housing had risen most within Copenhagen. And this, is, this has changed within the space of 10 years. And here you can see two maps of Copenhagen. One of them is, again, I sometimes like to use Google because that reflects current trends. Uh, among the first five results, this map was showing up twice, and it's a map that depicts the central areas of Copenhagen, um, but Norvest is it's in the upper uh, right, uh, left corner, looking from your side, and it's grey. It's not represented. It's not a place of interest. You have Nabru, you have Vestabu, you have other neighborhoods, but Norvest doesn't really figure on that map. It's there, but it's not designated, it's not named. And then you have the other map with the yellow areas, and that is a map of problems in Copenhagen, of disadvantaged housing areas, places where the municipality wants to intervene, uh, places of social problems, where you see Novest is also circled with a black line, but it's actually very well represented, it's very visible on this map. And that relates to a popular discourse of Novest as the municipal garbage bin, so the place where unwanted people would be put, people who are on social benefits, but historically um, they were also uh, people who had problems with drug addiction, uh, single mothers, also people with immigrant background. So it's a very stigmatizing uh, notion of what that place is and the people who live there. And that that clashes against this new, newer uh, story about Novest as a place where this is where things happen, this is where there's a lot of artists, this is where new galleries are opening, new wine bars, this is the new black of Copenhagen. So it's a very contested neighborhood. Um, and also the people who live there have different socioeconomic status and different, uh, different ideas about what is supposed to happen in that neighborhood. And that is what I set out to investigate in 2014 when I started doing research on Novest. It was how uh, the people who live there navigated the change that was going on uh, and how they felt included or excluded in the processes that were unfolding in their neighborhood. So I was interested in the people who lived there. And one of the places I focused on uh, was an association, an urban gardening association doing organic sustainable gardening called Integration Gardens. And they described themselves uh, as a place where integration would happen naturally, organically, through gardening. And in their statutes, they problematize the area where they're situated. They're saying this is an area with a lot of diversity, but also with a lot of problems. Social cohesion is not so good. This is why we have to be here. This is a reason for our existence. But uh, we have members from 39 different nationalities, and that is an asset for us. So there again you see this thing where diversity is both a risk and a danger, but also a really good thing and a resource. Um, and then they also say in their statutes that they want to dismantle social and cultural boundaries. 
And they operate with two kinds of members, members born in Denmark and members born outside Denmark. And this I find very interesting and significant because that means they want to move away from words that in Danish public discourse are stigmatized. Like actually an immigrant is a negatively con connotated word uh, in the Danish language. Um, and they don't want to speak about immigrants. They want to speak about where people were born. But that distinction is important for them because they want to ensure fair representation. They want to have half the members born in Denmark, half the member born outside. They have separate waiting lists. They have uh, it in their rules that at least two of the five members of the board should be born outside Denmark. So they really want to include the people who are born outside Denmark. And then, of course, like I mentioned, it's organic and sustainable gardening. It costs 600 Danish krona or about 100 euros to be a member a year. So it's not so cheap. And then they're supported by Copenhagen municipality and, and other funds. And the way they chose to designate space here was that if I had had a garden there, but I was just doing field work, I was watching other people's gardens, I didn't have my own, because you had to live very close to the gardening association to qualify. But me, not born in Denmark, I would have my garden here, all of them are equal, all of them are square. And then I would know before I met my gardening neighbors, that the person to my right, to my left, to my front and my back, they would all be born in Denmark. And I call this way of space making, I call it the integration grid. Um, and some people, uh, for example, Anne-Marie Fortier, she writes about proximity by design. So they really want people to mix. They really want to bring them close together. But what that also does, uh, and also this segregation of the waiting lists and representation in the board, is of course that it reinforces the distinction between people born in Denmark and people not born in Denmark. And in everyday language in the gardening community, people didn't say people born in Denmark, people not born in Denmark. They said Danes and foreigners. So it, in, it, in fact, it really cements this separation, which I found really paradoxical and, and also interesting. Um, and also what I found interesting was the people's different understandings of what integration meant. Um, Jean, who's a, who's a not born in Denmark member and a person of color who was sitting in the board at that time, he told me that integration uh, may, means that people get to know each other and have the possibility to talk together and get close together without being afraid. So he actually also speaks about fear um, as a problem sometimes when people meet across differences. And then another member told me, ah, integration is a smart word to get money from the municipality. <laughs> because, because of course, as you also heard, the language that they use to talk about diversity as a risk and oh, we have to take care of social cohesion, of course, those papers are read by their sponsors. And what, what people also problematized, people who were members in the association, was how there are different people in the association. There are those who become objects for integration, and then there are also the so-called well-integrated foreigners or expats, who normally the municipality would not address in their uh, interventions because they have very well-paid jobs. But in this, in this case, they're, they're all dumped into this foreigner category. Um, but what I also found very interesting was that there was also another way of relating to space. As I did field work in the Gardening Association over two summers, what I noticed was, yes, people talked a lot about Danes and foreigners, for example, how their Danish neighbor would email them because, oh, you're not harvesting your tomatoes, remember to harvest your tomatoes. And then the person was like, no, but I'm leaving them for seed. Uh, and it was interesting how people just talked about the Danes or the foreigners. But in fact, they were there to do gardening. They were not there to integrate. That was very, very clear. And they were talking a lot about different plants, also about Danish plants and foreign plants, and about Fran plants that had followed them from the country that they had grown up in, or that had been brought by their family. So it was a lot about gardening practices and how plants became... Uh, almost agents or companions, people's companions in their process of homemaking in Denmark. And that was, that was very interesting to me, how there was this, and I call that the web of gardening. So in the photo you see Joe's garden, he was from the US, and he called his garden Joe's Ranch, and he was growing corn, but then he also had these, he said Danish strawberries that he had gotten from his Danish gardening neighbor. 
So this this space around plants was a whole other way uh, for thinking about interactions in the gardens, and and that also transcend uh, to some extent. It did involve the Danish foreigner binary, but it also transcended that. But then, of course, this space of gardening had limited. Uh, consequences for human to human interactions that happen in the gardens because that was a lot about how people related to their garden and to their plants. So I think this uh, this space, the integration gardens, already gives us some idea about how we can think about diversity or differences because it's really interesting that the diversity management they do in the gardens actually uh, that it aims to impose mixing, right? Like I, I cannot turn without facing some Dane here, right? But that actually enforces the, because people wouldn't know my Danish is quite good. They wouldn't necessarily think, oh, she's not from Denmark. That's not the first thing. Be yeah, that, that's, that happened since 2004. I'm no longer seen as Eastern European immediately. Uh, but people would think of me as non-Danish just because of where my garden was located, even though I'm white and I might look Danish to them. And it also has this idea about who should mix or integrate with whom, because the two waiting lists in the gardening association, the one who was supposed to be the foreigner or not born in Denmark waiting list was much shorter uh, because it was relatively expensive to be a member, but also because they weren't really recruiting in different languages or in different places. But what was a problem by some of the Danish members of the board was that they don't really want to be here. They don't really want to come. Why, do we, why should we give them half of the gardens? They don't really want to come and mix with us. So whose responsibility is it to participate and who is seen as not wanting to participate is also something that becomes quite apparent here. And who is that who conceives diversity? Because in, in this case, everyone who is born outside Denmark is somewhat diverse, which is also interesting. So now I would like to go to another example from Novest, which is the example of diversity tourists. And in 2014, there was a book that was made about Novest uh, called Postcards from Novest. It was made by these two people that you see on the left, Simon and Line, and it was to promote a shopping street in Novest. And the, and the other photos are actually taken from the book. And they were holding a launch for the book. And what I noticed in this launch, which was in front of a Turkish bakery that makes amazing baklava, was that all the people who had met up for the launch were looked like Simon and Line and me pretty much. All people maybe in their 20s, 30s, maybe a few a bit older, speaking Danish, uh, white people, looking like they maybe were university educated. Um, and then all the photos in the book were not of people that looked like us. All the photos in the book were the people who worked in the Turkish bakery, which you can see in the lower right corner, the people who normally sit outside Turish, uh, Turkish bakery, which you can see next to that in the left uh, lower corner, or someone shopping at the green grocers. And that was very peculiar to me that we were all there to celebrate the diversity of Novest that was represented in this book, but we were not represented in the book. And then that also was something that became more striking to me as I was interviewing people. And I'm sharing the first quote with you here, where Kasper, who's in his 30s, a uh, white Danish person, uh, tells me that, yeah, he's lived there for eight years in this neighborhood. But he says, I am more of a tourist. I live in Novest, but I'm also an observer and maybe not really a part of it. I think most people who live here have the identity, the district identity in one way or another. They are aware of that if they had another job, I think many are proud and happy to live here, but it is more a place one ends up in, more a place where people simply are. It's not something people have chosen. I don't think there are many who think, now I'm moving to Novest because that's where I'd like to live, but that's what I've done myself though. Hmm. And then he laughs. I don't know, maybe it's such young elitist tourists like me. And this was actually the first interview that I did. And I was really struck uh, that he saw himself as a tourist. And also this dichotomy between people who are stuck there and then these elitist people who are free to move. Um, and that actually began to really come across in my interview narratives. And I did a few interviews with white middle class Danish, uh, Danish informants who might be seen as gentrifiers also. 
And there's different practices that I gathered or collected in this analytical figure of diversity tourists. And I'll tell you about them in turn. But they are, the first one pertains to different ways of consuming diversity. The second one relates to how people look for reality, a different reality in Novest. And the final one speaks about how they look for ways to escape Copenhagen. They want to get away from Copenhagen because Novest is actually not in Copenhagen, but it is. But no, it's, it's, it's different. It's a different place for them. Um, and in these, uh, in these effective practices, they navigate proximity and distance to what diversity is then supposed to be from their own position, which is felt to be a position of privilege. So the first one, consumption of diversity. So the first elements of this um, diversity is pra framed as entertaining, as a spectacle, as stimulating, as something that is very, sometimes maybe a bit provocative, but in general, it's, it's, it's really something that excites you. Um, so Sarah and Robert, they're a married couple with kids and they've been living outside Copenhagen for a couple of years for professional reasons. And now they're back in Novest, in the place where they used to live before. And they talk about Novest and they say, Sarah, one does not really go to a restaurant here. It's all kebab and such. It's all immigrants and such. All of it. But it's okay. It's what we've missed when we were away. So we're totally in, Robert. We have missed the immigrants. The immigrants is what we've missed. The mark and their shouting on the streets and smells and shouts and such. The first six months after returning, we went to a greengrocer's every day. It was so cool. And the women standing there talking and arguing and you don't know what half of the things are. So they're really infatuated with this diversity that, that is definitely not them, but they're consuming it. And also Hannibal, uh, he relates diversity not just to immigrants or people who are not white, but he uh, relates uh, diversity to, to, he says, there are these types, not cases as such, you know. There is N, for example. He is this type of character in the neighborhood, you know, that you meet here and don't meet anywhere else. There's that cat lady who walks around and talks to the cats. You know, then there's the pub. There are these characters, the lesbian punk couple that lives there and the young students that live there. And there are all the Somalis and that hang out. And it's like a lot of adornments and a lot of funny, strange, unusual people you maybe don't see in the rest of the city. So you see how diversity is not just ethnicity or race, but diversity is also social background, uh, a class. It's related to how much money people have. It's related to their sexuality. The lesbian punk couple are also diverse. The cat lady is diverse. So diversity is basically everything that's, div that's deviant, that's different from this norm that they don't really talk about, but that they embody. Um, but diversity is not just entertaining. It's actually also alternative pedagogy. It's something that enables my informants to become better people and their ch children to become better people. Um, so it's also uh, a vitamin pill. Sarah says, again, this couple, it's a value for us and for our children that things don't have to be in a certain way. There's room for differences. Diversity. It's more important to pick rags than to wear the right kind of clothes. What we see as important that our children don't, don't put importance into that, that they don't attend a class full of fashionably correct children all the way through, but that they get used to that the world look, just looks speckled. It does here in any case, and they laugh. Um, and also Peter, who again talks about his daughter, he says that she can navigate all sorts of different social codes and understand them and be open and not afraid not afraid of the language and values that are tied to them, but rather just immerse herself in them and be curious. She has amazing pre preconditions for that. And Andreas says, there's often more life in a garbage bin. There's a possibility to meet a lot of crazy people and be afraid, actually, and scared, and all the things that a living city has. There needs to be places where where one almost in anger or in positivity is pressured to have an opinion about where one is. And I think Novest offers that. So he's actually referring to this very stigmatized trope of Novest as a garbage bin. And then he's fetishizing that. He's saying, but that's actually a good thing because that enables me to encounter differences and to be provoked. So this is very much a consumption narrative, but a consumption narrative that allows people to feel very good about themselves and their kids as well. But, but because then they're tolerant, they're really tolerant and they're learning a lot by their proximity, chosen proximity to diversity. 
But they also highlight Novest as a place that offers a different reality, and that's related to diversity as well. Sene, who's in her 60s, she says, where we live now, we see all kinds of people, also people doing really bad, both mentally and financially. There are the drunks and the addicts, but it's the reality and you see it when you live here. So it's valuable to be exposed to, the, to this reality, even though it's also taxing and one gets sad, but, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing that one sees this. Um, and again, Kasper, he puts many words on this kind of reality. He says that Novest is a break from Copenhagen, a break in the reality. He uses the word in the definite form in Danish, a break in the reality for an academic, well-educated young part of Copenhagen that defines the city a lot. I think it does in other areas. Uh, here, there are also other people. There is a reality that, that I think is exciting and can be hard to grasp in some of these other districts. It's a part of the diversity to see what the reality is. If one would have children, he doesn't. If one would have children, it would be a super cool place in this way. Whoa, it would be healthy to get another piece of reality by growing up in such a place and being influenced by all sorts of impressions in different ways. So Novest is both an ultimate reality, the ultimate reality, and it's also a different piece of reality, but it's a very strong idea of how this place is more real than what he calls, um, he doesn't say white actually, but he calls it a well-educated young part of Copenhagen. So this longing for reality is also there. And then finally, there's also, people also seek escape and a break from Copenhagen, which was also implicit in what Kasper was just saying. Another informant says that it's people like me who destroy Norvest, all sorts of artsy types. He d identifies himself that way. Well, there are lots of loads of them in other places, uh, Nørrebro and Vestibor, other neighborhoods. And that is also a bit what one is moving away from. One wants to get, one wants to, get to a place where where there are more differences, where not so many people like oneself, this place is still local. And another informant actually even says that she's running away from her clones. And yet another informant, Sune, he says, Novest is more relaxed. There's something very cool about this letting be in a world where everything is about to, in a reality where everything is streamlined into these kinds of processes of development. I really enjoy this bleakness and standstill of Novest, things that just are and still work out in a way. It's damn important that there isn't this developmental perspective all the time. Where is this district going? Everything needs to be developed and optimized and improved. So Novest is a place where things can just be and not everything needs to have a story, not everything needs to be marketed all the time. And that enables my inform us to relax there, to feel more at peace somehow. Um, and it's interesting because uh, their longing for Novest, their consumption of Novest, is something that for them justifies their presence in the neighborhood. And they definitely feel that they are the good white people or the good uh, Danish people. Uh, this is captured by Liv uh, and she says, it's not really my hood. The whites can belong, so she actually speaks about race. The whites can belong so many places, but Novest is one of the places with many non-whites. I think it's a bit more the non-whites place. But then I can sneak in a little bit by applauding this multiculturalism. And she's being self-ironic, but also that is actually how she thinks of herself, that she's this tolerant multiculturalism-loving Dane, and that is why she belongs in Novest. So when I think of diversity tourism as an analytical figure and why I think it's important for us to think uh, to th or it can be important angle on what diversity is, is that it, it captures how uh, people who uh, situate themselves in a, in a space of intersectional privilege um, kind of contrast this privilege to what diversity represents for them. And then of course it's also a perspective that is defined by a gentrifying neighborhood where people with more money um, are moving in. And it also speaks to commodifi commodification of diversity. And it's a, it's a big literature. For example, Bell Hooks has written about um, eating the other. 
So we saw the people in the green grocers consuming different herbs, different spices. Sarah Ahmed has written about stranger uh, fetishism. So this kind of idea that the strange is really exciting. Um, while in my interviews, this pedagogical dimension was more highlighted, and that is where I contribute to the literature, that it's also about better personhood. It's not only about excitement and stimulation. But what it also shows is, and there's emerging research on kind of tolerant, progressive Danish middle-class whiteness, but how it's really self-centered because these people cannot see the neighborhood from any other perspective than their own. Um, it's really about what diversity can do for them. And it's not about when they think about themselves as encroaching in someone else's space, they justify that through their love for diversity. Um, and also it highlights the importance of feelings because I think you notice that all the excerpts were very, uh, the interview excerpts were very full of feeling for diversity. Uh, and feeling is very important for my work. Uh, so affect scholarship. So I'm combining uh, thinking about affect and feeling and thinking about um, diversity in this figure. But some of you might have also wondered, but what about me? Uh, you know, I think it, because it really mattered that people were telling these things to me. And I also said that I looked a bit like Simon and Lena at that book reception. And some informants also challenged me. Uh, they were asking me, but why did you come to Novest to study encounters with difference? Why not some wealthy part of Copenhagen? Aren't you also contributing to the stigmatizing, uh, to stigmatizing the neighborhood? Um, and I was thinking about this. I was thinking, what were my preconceived ideas? Why did I go to Novest? And I came to see myself as something I call a representative of an industry of urban diversity researchers. So I was, of course, also reinforcing some ideas about which neighborhoods are problematic, which places should we study? And something that also became clear to me as I was thinking about this. So I agree with Lenten and Titley who wrote in 2011 that the issue, the important issue for us to research is not one of whether people accept or reject uh, diversity, but it's important to examine who qualifies to be recognized as diversity, but also who does not, who passes unremarked. Um, and also as Bell Hooks says, uh, it's important to consider the perspective from which we look, vigilantly asking ourselves, who do we identify with? Whose image do we love? So thinking about our gaze and the directionality of our gaze. And she also speaks about love, and love is something I will return to later on in my talk. But so diversity for whom? And I came to think more and more about my research of positionality, and again about affect, about feelings. And I situate myself um, in the tradition of feminist scholarship where knowledge is not neutral. Knowledge depends on the place that we occupy. Uh, Donna Haraway speaks about situated knowledges. Adrian Rich speaks about politics of location. Many other scholars who worked in this line. And also thinking about intersectionality, which differences matter, and how feelings matter for that mattering of difference. Uh, which was also visible in the in, in, in the interview excerpt. So this is actually how I started working with autoethnography because I could see that as these white middle-class Danish informants were telling me these things about diversity, they really thought I would mirror them. They thought that I shared these things with them. And it's not so important if I did or did not, but the fact that they could automatically read me as someone who would understand what they to were talking about, that was very interesting because I was definitely not diverse in Novest. And there was an episode in the local library that really highlighted this for me. And this is the local library in the pictures. It was a very prestigious, one of these gentrification also projects uh, by a Danish famous architect's office and a very beautiful public library. And it was a place where I was also hanging out when I was doing my field work. And one day uh, there was a drone building workshop and kids were building these drones and they were also using remote controls. They were driving around the library. And there was an older man who became very distressed and he started talking about surveillance and the US and he was talking louder and louder. And I was sitting at a table, I was sitting across a man, maybe also around my age, maybe a bit older. Um, and he, he suddenly opened his mouth and he was, and, and I could see that this other man was getting distressed and I was noticing that. 
But then this man who was brown sitting across from me and the man who was getting distressed was black. He turned to me and he said, why don't you go to the librarian and get them to address this problem? And why don't you talk to the librarian in the Danish language? And I hadn't thought about the language of the man sitting across from me. I thought he was Danish. And he, but he thought I was Danish. And I was not Danish, but I could speak Danish to the librarian, which is also what I did. And then I was thinking afterwards, it's, this is not just about who looks Danish and how people look Danish. Uh, but it's also about gender, of course, um, that the librarian was also likely to be a white woman, white Danish woman. I was also a white, white woman, you know, and I would be more likely to maybe de-escalate the situation. I wouldn't be seen as someone who is potentially, you know, someone connected to all sorts of ideas about terrorism and public safety and crime. All of these are very racialized and gendered tropes in Denmark as they are here. So I would be this representative of Danishness who could go and take care of the problem, which I could do. So again, it didn't matter that at that point I had been in Denmark for 10 years, um, but it also mattered what I embodied and how I, how I carried myself in space. I actually also carried myself as someone who could speak to the librarian. I was not used to the librarian looking away or perceiving me as dangerous or weird. So my movements in space were really affected by this. And I really came to think about how no one ever in Novest, when I was interviewing them, so I also had a researcher role, no one her, had ever asked me, but where are you from? Where are you really from? Because of your accent. And people still ask that to me in Denmark, but in other settings, in other settings, they notice my accent. But when I was a researcher affiliated with the Danish university, my accent somehow didn't matter so much. Then they were curious about instead where I lived in Copenhagen. And then when I said that I lived in this neighborhood that is known as a quite upper middle class neighborhood, and I was actually li living in this co-op that was um, in a decaying building and, and not very fancy at all, but just the neighborhood itself caused people to be a bit suspicious of me. Because was I this upper middle class person coming to, but then again, I was from this university that's known a, a, as an alternative leftist university, so maybe I was okay. But my accent didn't matter. These other things mattered. My accent didn't. So the article that I wrote about this is called Recruited into Danishness, and it talks about how I, through whiteness, but also gender and also my position as a researcher and, and signifiers of class, but also this entitlement that I had come to feel in Denmark, because after so many years and after having Danish education, Danish friends, Danish jobs, becoming employable in Denmark, I was I was in a different position and I was into a position as in, in a position of someone who could claim Danishness, but also by, inf by informants, they even, you know, they really didn't want to hear that I had an accent. They really wanted to, to have this mirroring with me. Uh, we could love diversity together. That's, that's, that's how we related to one another. And I was not an Eastern European person at all in that space, which I, which I still can be when I meet people outside of field work. So that was, that was interesting for me. Uh, and again, very interesting thinking about how differences matter differently in different contexts. And here I want to say a bit how I think about racialization and whiteness, which is a subject area of mine. So racialization is a term that was first used by Franz Fanon in the 60s, uh, quite a while ago. And I would phrase it as a process of assigning value to human beings, but also places, because we have, for example, racialized housing areas, as was apparent in the case of Novest, and entities even, based on embodied markers of difference that are inscribed in racial hierarchies. So Keskinen and Andreasen, when they write about this in the Nor Nordic setting, they write about the varied ways ideas of race are turned into practices on different levels of the society. And uh, Irina Molina, in the Swedish context, talks about processes that differentiate people, stabilize these differences, and le legitimate power differences based on them. So it has both material, affective, and discursive dimensions. And then following from this, whiteness, designates a sense of superiority, entitlement, and privilege. But other researchers have also written in the Dutch context, Gloria Wecker, for example, about white innocence. Sullivan has written about good white people. So again, remembering the diversity tourists. Um, Hassan Haj uh, has written about um, that whiteness can be a capital that can be accumulated. Um, James Baldwin writes about white guilt, how um, 
white people can feel this guilt that immobilizes them uh, affect without responsibility. So for example, when Sana spoke about Novest and all the problems in Novest, she said, but that's the reality. So she feels bad about having the privileges that she has, but she doesn't have to interfere because that's just the reality and it's sad, but it's the reality. So, so it, I think it captures this dimension of, of that whiteness can also have. And then Sarah Ahmed writes about affective orientations and uh, Karen Belland writes about how whiteness is also tied into ideas about good life. And here we again can think about uh, migration from Eastern to Western Europe, for example, how that often research shows us is related to ideas about a normal life, a human worthy life that one can attain in Western Europe. So if we think about this notion of whiteness, then that is also a racialized idea of the good life that one can, that one can uh, achieve. And then in some of my writing, for example, this article about recruited into Danishness, I also talk about whiteness as mobility. So how, uh, how it allows me to move through spaces, how it allows me to go and talk to the librarian, but also in general just opens doors for me. And then differentiated whiteness is something that is work in progress for me, where I'm arranging, I just did a conference in Iceland and a conference panel in the summer next year, and I've uh, co-written an article that is in press, where I speak more about, mm, other people talk about hierarchies or shades of whiteness, and I talk about differentiated whiteness. Um, and now the final part, or the final vantage point for my keynote, uh, which is work in progress, and which also relates to whiteness, difference, and diversity. And I'm pausing a bit because it's not just because it's work in progress, but it's also because it's more sensitive for me because um, here I'm talking about some things I did wrong. And I think that's important for me in my autoethnographic work that it's, it's of course vulnerable work, but this work is vulnerable for me in a different way. So it's uh, about intersectional pedagogy. So hoping to work towards ways of teaching that account for the differences in the room. Um, and I work at a university that is very proud of diversity, very proud to have students from different backgrounds. It was founded in the 1970s, partially in opposition to more traditional hierarchical universities in Denmark and elsewhere. It's a part of the Critical Edge Alliance of progressive universities worldwide, including Latin America. So again, this thinking about different epistemologies and decolonizing the curriculum, it's very in at our university, um, that likes to see itself as a societally engaged and critical university. Um, but of course, it's also still a university that is an educational institution in a in a society where there are a lot of problems, where there is racism. So, so it's, it's interesting how the university navigates this. Um, and I've been reading a lot about different pedagogies, uh, and I've been reading about how um, some people, for example, highlight how it is a very sensitive space, uh, a teaching and learning space where are different differences present. Mm, and one uh, researcher writes, or it's a co-written article, but she says, I am used to hearing some students make comments that are wounding to others in the group as part of the process of working through their ideas. And she kind of says, this is something that happens, it's unavoidable. Um, and also Zambilas uh, writes about how teachers must create the kind of environment of trust that allows emotions of woundedness, no matter where they come from, to be worked through. And I am not quite sure, actually, if I agree with them, because I think that it cannot be avoided, perhaps, which is what I'll return to, but it's actually, it matters. It matters where our woundedness comes from, and different things uh, are perceived and heard differently based on people's lived experiences, and sometimes experiences of, of discrimination and experiences of violence. And I think for me, as someone who facilitates that space and has responsibility for what's going on, for me, it matters. It matters where people's woundedness comes from. And this is very related to very, very contested issues in Danish society today and also across Europe, because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of advocacy for the idea that all opinions should be heard and voiced. Um, and that freedom of speech trumps all other concerns. 
But Hortensi Spillers wrote in the in 1987 that sticks and stones might break our bones, but words will most certainly kill us. So it's a paraphrase, and it's and it's a it's a piece um, where she talks about legacies of racism uh, and slavery, enslavement in the U.S. and how this valorization of again of racial hierarchies, how that very much has impact for people and how it continues to hurt them. So certain opinions will really, really hurt some people. And certain opinions, uh, there was a student who shared with me, it's a student who wears a headscarf, how for her, 90% of all learning happens outside class, because in class she just has to attend to all sorts of comments that are just very distracting for her learning. Um, which might be Islamophobic comments. And I do not want to accept that this happens in a space that I facilitate, but what can I do? Um, and just to show you how this is de debated in the Danish public uh, space. So this is a, a cartoon from a year ago where it was seen as problematic that uh, University of Copenhagen made guidelines for their students, which was there was actually no prohibition in these guidelines. The guidelines just said, please think before you arrange a dress-up party where people are encouraged to dress up as other cultures. So this, this of course, has been problematized throughout uh, Europe and, and people would not do this as readily in other places in the world. But in Denmark, this was a common practice to dress up. Even blackfacing was common practice until recently. And then in the Danish media, this was seen as very problematic. The universities are offending students' freedom of speech. So it's always the white Danish ma majority whose freedom of speech is the highest concern in Denmark. So it's, um, and of course, my university, as progressive as it wants to be, it's in Denmark and it's surrounded by these kinds of ideas and discourses. And of course, some students also have this idea that it's freedom of speech that is, is the most important thing. Um, so when I work uh, as a teacher, I have earlier especially been inspired by ideas about critical pedagogy uh, that are rooted in critical theory, where the teacher is aiming to create conditions for students to learn skills, knowledges, and modes of inquiry that will allow them to examine critically the role that society has played in their self-formation. And furthermore, being intentional about elucidating and even creating the inherent tensions where the members of the learning community will need to see the intersections between power, oppression, and pedagogy, identify their complicity in the status quo, and embrace their responsibility to act. So this has been very guiding for me, but I also think it's a bit limit limited. Uh, and I'll come back to why it's limited, but now I'll speak about what I did. Uh, so this is the material for this work that I'm in the process of writing on, on uh, pedagogical autoethnography. So I was co-teaching a course on cultural analysis um, and I was co teaching a part of the course um, where we analyzed interviews and the students did not have time to gather their own interview material as a part of the course. So I was selecting the excerpts for them and I thought, inspired by critical pedagogy, it's important to discuss racism with students because racism is a problem in Denmark. Although, as we saw yesterday, there was a presentation about Norway. Also in Denmark, there's this idea that racism is not a problem in Denmark. It's a post-racial society. There's a lot of color blindness. Uh, but I thought no, and also inspired by some articles, um, I have the references here, uh, we need to talk about racism. So I chose interview excerpts from other people's research and my own research that were about experiences of transnational adoptees growing up in Denmark, interracial intimacy, and also being brown and gay in Denmark. So these were the things I would be discussing with my students and how these particular um, research projects in general said something about racialization and racism in Denmark. And then I got informal evaluations in 2018. And this is the sensitive part because I think the student is right, but it's also the worst evaluation for me that I ever got, but also the best one because I'm learning a lot from that. But they wrote, lectures activities did not seem to be critical of positionality of the e concepts or topics being discussed. The studies of race and, and whiteness, concepts of racism being taught by a representative of whiteness. 
So in my teaching, I had talked about how I was a representative of urban diversity researchers. And the student, I think, picked up on this and said, uh -uh, you're still doing the same thing. And then they also wrote discussions uh, were not critical or aware of the implications these discussions had on minority students, marginalized students, students of color, which is completely right. Because what I realized was that I was teaching about racism and there were people who experienced that on a daily basis in the room. And for them, listening to these interview excerpts, if they were maybe about experiences which they shared, was very painful. And for them, it wasn't something new necessarily. Maybe the white Danish students, who unfortunately still are the majority of the student body at my university, for them it was something new. And also some of the students who had these marginalized experiences were also sharing them. And for them it seemed to be very important to vocalize that, but it wasn't everyone's experience. Some people were maybe even traumatized and distracted by me insisting on speaking about these issues in that way. And another student wrote, we have had good discussions, better than in many courses, but if everyone could feel why we were discussing these issues we've been through, the discussions and reflections would be brilliant. So again, this thing that, that some people can feel what is being discussed and others can't. And I had been trying to make the white Danish students feel this, but of course I can't. And in the process, I was not considering feelings of other students. So now I've changed uh, the course and I don't really have the time to go in detail with that. But I'm also writing about it because I think it's very important for us to think about at my university, but also uh, in general for practitioners. Um, and I'm thinking about pedagogies of discomfort, which have been proposed by some scholars, uh, where uh, the goal is to engage with topics like difference, race and social justice by troubling emotional comfort zones. That's what other researchers write. Um, and where we seek to uncover and question the deeply embodied emotional dimensions that frame and shape daily habits, routines and unconscious complicity with hegemony. But again, I think that this is a bit like critical pedagogy, negating the fact that for some people the discomfort is already there. It's not something that I don't need to create discomfort for my white Danish, or maybe for the white Danish students, discomfort is something that I create by highlighting racism in Danish society and their complicity. But other people already maybe do not feel comfortable in the classroom because they're constantly reminded of being othered. Um, so how the classroom is always an uncomfortable space, how it reproduces structures of oppression and how there are, not in my university, I saw this in Northern America, but for example, walls of white men, accomplished scholars from that institution and they're only white men. So, so what, what does that institution embody? And Sarah Ahmed has written about stranger making, spaces that assume white bodies as their norm. Uh, which is not just whiteness, but also ability, socioeconomic background. It's much easier for students who come from families where parents have higher education, but it's also gender and sexuality and how uh, students of color often navigate the institution under the scorching gaze of whiteness. This comes from Esther Ojito's work uh, and how the educational system is still a white supremacist system, even in this very progressive university and safe learning space is a majority fantasy. So this is actually the space that, that I have to position myself in. And here I actually have to think again about my own positionality uh, because Mimi Orner writes, the body, she writes about herself, my body, the body of the teacher, is inseparable for, from the curriculum. Perhaps the body of the teacher is the curriculum. Because standing in front of a classroom, one also embodies what does it take to succeed in this institution? What does it take to become uh, a teacher? And here, where I was t t t teaching primarily the white Danish students, was that also part of my positionality as a, as a migrant, white migrant lecturer who, who maybe, you know, engages with whiteness instead of engaging with, with students of color, which, which was really something that I'm very ashamed of. And I'm sharing it with you because it has been a learning experience that I think is valuable. But whether I was teaching to the white Danish majority. So coming back to bell hooks, uh, this means that I need to know and scrutinize whose image do I identify with and who do I love and recognizing the differences in, in the room and how they matter. And coming back to the general topic for today, 
uh, I think that what I've aimed to show is how the language of diversity uh, can be this kind of empty, um, celebrating this empty pluralism uh, where power is bypassed and history is bypassed. And instead thinking about multiple differences can acknowledge how how the other is different and also how these differences are embodied in historical and political processes. And it's not just about culture in a narrow sense. And also leads me to think about how can we create spaces for living with differences together beyond this eject or consume? So what is good and what is bad difference? Uh, so who do we love? Uh, and I think love is really interesting because love also means commitment. Love is not this, for me at least, not this commodification, even though my informant said, oh, we love the immigrants. This is not the love that I'm talking about. The love that I'm talking about is commitment for being together despite perceived differences that might seem very important, but also knowing and acknowledging our positionality, our roots, our traditions, our orientations. And only then, I think, when we acknowledge where we stand and also what we aspire to without always having been aware of what we aspire to, love can function as a significant call for ordering the self and transcending the self, a strategy for remaking the self and moving beyond the limitations of selfhood. So love ca that can aim to an initiate personal, political and collective transformation. And coming back to the title of the conference and the theme for the conference, I was thinking about fear and fear is important. As you could see also some of my informants had highlighted fear as something that is an obstacle to to meaningful or uh, positive uh, encounters across difference. But inequality is something that I'd like to problematize. Um, and if we substitute fear with an inequality, building sustainable communities in times of inequality, I think it becomes apparent that that is just not possible. Sustainable communities are not possible. So I think we have to address inequality maybe before we think about fear, because also who has the tendency to fear whom? Again, thinking of me in this library, I was not someone to be feared. That's why I could go and, uh, and alert the librarian about what was going on. So I think fear, uh, accounting for fear and working too much with managing fear is also something that is not a neutral endeavor. Uh, so I want to finish uh, with a quote from Bell Hooks um, and I think also remain with this discomfort. Uh, but she says, holding each other close across differences beyond conflict through change is an act of resistance. But I think my point uh, with the keynote is also that this is not a process that feels good. I think if we look too much and seek too much ways to feel comfortable and good, I think that can be very dangerous because also not everyone can feel good, but the people who can, my informants who I, who I, who I, um, who, whose, whose accounts I use to work on this diversity tourism figure, for example, they feel good, but they do not act. So I think uh, we should be more uh, guided by our commitment to work against inequality and less guided by feeling good. If, if I'm engaging with this, what we should do, which I'm actually happy that you invite us to do because I think being normative can sometimes be refreshing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have uh, about five, seven minutes for questions. So there is a hand over there. And uh, could you pass this? Uh, thank you for your very, very interesting talk. Uh, my question is, is somewhat related to your uh, speech, but not entirely. Uh, yeah, you showed that uh, Google uh, tells us that the Danish people are very happy people, and also uh, survey data also shows us that Danes are very uh, happy. And uh, and, uh, and in, in Danish culture, the concept of hygge seems uh, very apparent, and I somehow related to this happiness. And uh, but uh, what do you think, or do you have some thoughts about uh, is hygge? a concept of uh, uh, university educated middle class white uh, Danish people or is it a broader concept? Uh, also, uh, is it a concept for the uh, people living in uh, uh, North, uh, yeah, this part of the uh, Copenhagen? Thank mm. you. Mm. 
Thank you very much for the question. Is everyone familiar with the Danish concept of hygge? Yeah, it's, it's traveled broadly. There's almost a hygge industry. And I think it's a very interesting question because, of course, it's promoted as a uniquely Danish thing. Uh, but candles are not specific to Denmark. Uh, if you again, if you would think of the Im imagery of hygge, it's very much related to Danish design. But there's also knitted socks, which people also have here in Latvia. So there's of course this uh, idea. If it's very specific to Denmark, that that can be contested. But I think where it's interesting, where there are certain links with Danishness, is how hygge is associated with comfort, and hygge is definitely something that feels good. Um, and there's places in Denmark where you can't really have hygge. You would never think of uh, these racialized housing areas, for example, and relate them to hygge, or uh, camps for asylum seekers and relate them to hygge. So hygge also has its exclusions. So I think thinking about difference and inequality, hygge can be very problematic because hygge is related to having you know, certain concerns. So this is what you actually have the space to do in your life. You have the space to think about a hygge environment. So you have some leisure time, you have some money to invest in hygge. So in that sense, it has also a very kind of political dimension as well. Um, and what is also interesting about hygge is how on one side it provides this effective shelter, you know, you're really closing yourself in and you're very, you know, you have this bubble of hygge. But also if you look at windows in Denmark, but also other Scandinavian countries, they're very elaborately lit in winter time and they're almost like these displays of hygge. So it's also something that one shows to the outside world. So it's not just a shelter and introverted bubble, it's also a facade. So I think hygge is actually very interesting, a very interesting phenomenon to study. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Seems so. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, I would like to hear your comment on what I now say. Uh, truth seeking has, in my mind, always been an essential feature of university life. That means you have people who have different ideas about what reality is like meet each other in academic discussion. That means that we believe some of these ideas are true, others are false. The people who have good arguments, we hope, win, and the others feel disappointed, uncomfortable, sorry, but we learn as we grow up, as we go through the university too. That's the, that's the conditions of academic discussion. We also learn that if we talk rhetorical terms, we should try to separate logos from ethos and pathos. So we should try to listen to the arguments, not who is speaking. Because mm -hmm. many people could say the right things, irrespective of if they are white men or whatever they are. Mm -hmm. So in your talk, I see these ideals disappearing mm -hmm. over the horizon. Am I correct in yes. my perception? Yes, you're very correct. And that's because we have different um, ideas about knowledge production. So I work with the plurality uh, of knowledges in my teaching. And if you look back at feminist scholarship, for example, situated knowledge, Donna Haraway is very much against what she calls the God trick. So, and which is interesting because in the previous panel we had this discussion about whether one uses I or we or men in other languages. Men is very interesting because it's a neutral pronoun, but in fact it is, this is like it, it uh, conveys a male gender rather than female. So in my classroom, for example, I would be interested in, um, because sometimes some students, and this, this is not just, uh, this can be related to many factors. There are students who maybe know a lot and they won't say anything because they're insecure about themselves and I want to create um, an environment that is encouraging for those students and it's not that the students who are used to being very successful and always raise up their hand I don't want to discourage them I don't want them to feel uncomfortable but I want people to be able to speak from their different points of departure because we also have ideas about you know for example embodied knowledge or arts um, in some places, they're still not very interesting for, for uh, university researchers, but I know researchers. I haven't done a collaborative project with artists myself. But again, you know, what is intelligence? Traditionally, in Western epistemology, intelligence was just the rational mind and the body is not really interesting for us. And now we have all these ideas about multiple senses in research and how art, artistic knowledge can be really interesting. So, so this is really moving and different people have different ideals. I recognize your ideal. I just have a different one. 
I'm very interested in the body and the feelings, for example, as something that is part and parcel of knowledge production. So this, am I, but I'm interested yeah. in it to find out in a true way what's going on. Mm. To me, it seems like you're, let's say, moving the ideals of psychotherapy into the academic seminar discussion. We are supposed to, you know, express our feelings. I, We're supposed to feel what, say what, no. how we experience things, etc., etc. No, we're not supposed to express them, but we can't help have them. That is sure. my idea. That yeah. is my idea. And the feelings of some people are just never in the way. They, 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 you know, they've always been able to express their feelings. They've always been able to move about in spaces. For example, like like these students in Denmark who are actually have usually been able to express racist views, and this is something that I want. And 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 they ever seen as the truth in Denmark is that freedom of knowledge, uh, freedom of speech is the god, and I'm Just challenging that truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, but I think perhaps you, if you're curious, you can read a bit. I can give you some references about feminist scholarship, because that is not the same. That is not the same as psychotherapy. So I think you're discrediting that if you call it psychotherapy. It, it is. I'm acknowledging your ideal for good science, and I think you could perhaps also acknowledge others. Uh, and and, and th that's a kind of coexistence. No, that's not part of the traditional. <laughs> okay. Thing. Okay. okay. No. Okay. My power of interfering. Do we have? Yeah, we have one more question, and I think uh, if any. Okay, so two more questions, and uh, and then we could conclude. Uh, thank you, Linda, for the brilliant presentation. It's more common than a question. Um, you talk about Norway in a such brilliant way that. Um, I think you have to be assigned to the municipality of Copenhagen <laughs> promoting <laughs> the, the region because I'm thinking to visit uh, the place when I'm next time in Copenhagen. And uh, also I just wanted to uh, say that when we are saying Scandinavia, I feel myself excluded a little bit coming from Finland. Uh, mm. <laughs> and I wanted to mm. <laughs> kind of ask you, say Nordics, <laughs> so that mm, true, I feel, true, I feel true, in, true. myself too. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> You're so right about that, yeah. But I think I, I might have committed other mistakes as well, because for example, some people talk about Nordic exceptionalism when they talk about how this, many of the Scandinavian countries have this idea of themselves being exceptionalist in some way, and that is, of course, also a gross overgeneralization and lumping together of different countries. And I and I might have committed this kind of mistake in many ways, like in so to making some shortcuts in my speech. But you're right. Like uh, I, I just met some Finnish researchers um, doing research on similar topics in Finland, and this, of course, has local specifics. For example, in Finland, the Finland-Estonia relations are a very important local factor that is not in the same way apparent in the Danish case. There's not one Baltic country where there's this kind of relationality. So there, they are, there's a lot of peculiarities in the Finnish setting that, that are very important. Mm -hmm. And yes? Mm? Okay, so there's another question. Yeah, thank you very much for a rich, rich presentation. Um, there are lots of um, things I would have liked to discuss with you, but I just um, would like to to ask you about uh, now about about the gardening and the board, how they how they deal with these challenges of problems with recruiting immigrants. Um, what kind of strategies do they discuss in the board? Mm. Actually, after I presented them my research, because I was engaging with them, uh, they decided to lower the annual membership fee, because the thing was they had so many sponsors. The membership fee was because they wanted to have workshops about a particular way of growing tomatoes or something like this. So they decided to drop these extra activities and make it cheaper for people to be members, because this amount of money might not seem very much, but it's a lot if you go to the green grocers, you can buy so many vegetables for 100 euros. So then it's a lot of money. So they made it cheaper. And they also uh, said that they would consider arranging events that they didn't want to reconsider how they distributed the space, but they said they would consider arranging events where people could exactly meet and talk about recipes, but also plants that they were growing, because this was an area where they, you know, I, I told them about all this, you know, how plants traveled with people, and they thought, oh, it would be great if people shared some of these stories with one another. So those were some of the things they did, yeah. 
Okay, so I'm afraid we are running out of time. So thank you so much, Linda, for your wonderful presentation. We are now doing, uh, walking to the, yeah. Okay, applauses. <laughs> thank you.